Peace be with you. It's great to be with you all this morning. My name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors here at Veritas. So we're going to be, this morning we're going to be looking together at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, Romans 5, 1 through 5. But before we begin, let's, let's take a moment to pray together. Father, you are the gracious and holy God, the one who deserves all glory, honor, and praise. And we're truly grateful to be your gathered people here this morning, and we pray that you would speak through me to your people the timeless truths and precious promises that you have for us here in your word. Would you open our ears to hear and our eyes to see, incline all our hearts to you this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of my absolute favorite movies growing up was the movie Rudy. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. It's, it. It tells a true story about Daniel Rudiger, nicknamed Rudy. He's played, played by Samwise Gamgee, or I guess his real name is Sean Astin. Uh, but it tells the story about Rudy, this, this, this young man in the 70s who, who grew up with this dream of one day playing football for the University of Notre Dame. The only problem was Rudy was way too short and scrawny to play football. And his grades were far too low to get into the university. But Rudy had this hope, this dream of experiencing glory on the football field of, of, in a Notre Dame jersey. But it seemed at every step he, couldn't, he just couldn't quite get there. He, he attends a local college for two years and at first and finally gets his grades up and gets into Notre Dame for his junior year. But he's still not eligible for the football team. In his senior year, the closest he can get is to a spot on the scout team, which basically only exists to get pummeled every day in practice by the actual team. As scene after scene in the movie of Rudy, bloodied and battered as he continues to get up again and again. But then at the end of the season, Rudy starts to lose hope that he'll, he'll never actually get a chance to actually dress with the team. But then in a very moving scene, Toward the end of the movie, each of the players start to walk into the coach's office one by one and lay their jerseys on the coach's desk, insist that the coach dress Rudy in their spot. And the coach finally gives in, but Rudy is still only on the sidelines with the team. There, there's little hope of him actually getting in to play in the game. That is, until the players and the crowd start to chant his name and the chants start to grow louder and louder around the stadium until eventually the coach finally allows Rudy to go in for the final couple plays of the game. And on the very last play, Rudy's teammate, he, take, he intentionally takes two blockers on himself so Rudy can get around the end and sack the opposing quarterback. And the crowd goes wild for Rudy. Rudy. They start chanting his name. All the players come around him. They lift him up on their shoulders, and they carry him off the field while they, while they shout his name. And after all that Rudy had to endure, he finally gets to taste his long-hoped-for glory on the football field at Notre Dame. And see, this is just a great story about hope and endurance that leads to a long-awaited glory. But in our passage this morning, we're going to see that we are a part of an even greater story of hope that helps us to endure as we await the greatest future, future glory possible. So if you'd stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Let's listen to these words from our gracious and holy God that he's given to us here in Romans 5, 1 through 5. 
Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And please be seated. Well, we've just completed a sermon series for Advent, looking at four particular reasons that Christ has come into the world to be our propitiation or our wrath-appeasing sacrifice, and to give us reconciliation, justification, and adoption with the Father. And while our passage this morning certainly touches up against all four of these doctrines, the focus here begins with our justification, which is our being declared righteous in Christ. So just to give some necessary context, as we jump into the middle of Romans here, the Apostle Paul has just spent the first few chapters explaining our desperate need for justification as those who have sinned against a holy God. Then in chapter 4, Paul explains the means of our justification, which is by faith alone and Christ alone. Now, the whole tone of the letter changes here in chapter 5. As Paul goes from explanation to exaltation. Paul begins to rejoice, and he invites all Christians into this rejoicing in the present benefits and future hope that comes from our justification. He continues to delight in this all the way through Romans chapter 8. And Paul wants us to understand here that knowing the important truths of God, such as doctrines like justification, they do in fact have real-life implications for every area of our lives. Knowing God and what He has done, what He has promised to do, and the amazing privileges that He's given us through it, it changes the way we both see and live our lives. Paul starts to emphasize these through, starts to emphasize these through these chapters, the most incredible blessings for the Christian life. One, most of all, that he brings out to us is the blessing of hope. And Paul has much to say about hope here in Romans 5. So as we start to work through our passage this morning, I I want us to see this big idea emerge that the gospel of Jesus Christ brings true hope for the sinner, the sufferer, and the saint. We're going to work through it in three different parts. The first, hope for the sinner in verses 1 and 2. And then secondly, hope for the sufferer in verses 3 and 4. And then lastly, hope for the saint in verse 5. So first, let's look at hope for the sinner. Now, Paul begins here in verse 1 by saying, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here at the start of Romans 5, Paul begins with the word therefore. And as we've heard Pastor Garrison say before, whenever we hear the word therefore, we need to ask what it's there for. So in this case, Paul's using this word therefore to connect everything that he's about to say to everything that he's just explained in the first four chapters. He starts this passage by telling us that since God has now declared us righteous by our faith in Christ, this is how we get to benefit. He's saying to the sinner, you were an enemy of God and and far off from him, totally undeserving of his grace and love. But since God has now saved you, and you've placed your faith in Christ, you've been justified, receiving His righteousness. Now, as a result, you have these amazing benefits to enjoy. And He's showing us these benefits in three sort of progressing phases that completely change the sinner's position before God. Peace, grace, and glory. A reconciliation a bringing near, 
and a fixed future. And so he starts in with the first one here in verse 1, which is the peace we've been given with God that we get to enjoy through Jesus Christ. When Pastor Garrison preached at the beginning of Advent on Christ coming to bring reconciliation and peace with God. And we looked at Paul's words in Colossians 1. Paul says in verses 21 and 22 of Colossians 1, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. This is extremely good news for the sinner, that Jesus, by our justification, has brought about peace with God. This, reconcilia- this reconciliation is, is God's act of bringing broken sinners back into right relationship with Him. And I want to be clear here because I think when we tend to think about peace, we think about it in purely an experiential kind of way, a, a nice peaceful walk through the woods or, or sitting quietly on a beach somewhere. But the peace we've been given with God is not merely a feeling of peace, but an eternal reality that we desperately need. Jesus has given us our much-needed peace with God, restoring our relationship with our Heavenly Father that was broken at the fall in Genesis 3. And furthermore, we're only able to experience any true peace in our lives as Christians because we've first been given this peace with God through Christ. We need to keep in mind here that we've done nothing and could do nothing to earn this peace with God. He's made this happen himself by sending his son to die in our place for our sin and to give us his righteousness. We're simply made alive by God to place our faith in Christ, and we get to reap all the benefits. We don't believe what Mormons believe, that we're saved by grace through faith after all that we can do. We are saved by God's grace through faith after all that Christ has done. For all who believe, this is, is certainly a cause for humility and rejoicing, as Paul is modeling for us here. But for those of you who don't believe, who don't have this peace with God, I, I want to invite you into this peace. Jesus Christ has made a way for all who turn from their sin and turn to Him in faith to be justified and given this peace with God. He invites you out of a life of restlessness, and into a life of hope and rest as you have your relationship with your God restored. And once we have this peace with God, we have even more benefits to enjoy. Paul moves on in verse 2, saying, Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. The next privilege we've been given is grace. A position of ongoing grace and privilege with God that we stand in forever. God has given us peace peace with Him, which is amazing and much needed, but now even better, we get Him. After all, what would be the purpose of celebrating our peace with God and the reconciliation of our broken relationship with Him if we didn't get God, an intimate access to Him through the right relationship with Him? If we have a broken relationship with with someone close to us, say a parent, for example, and we make peace and we restore the relationship, what would we celebrate unless that we now get access to that person again? We get to see them and hear from them again, get to talk to them and live our lives with them by our sides again. Them knowing us, us knowing them again in an intimate way that wasn't possible when we were separated by hostility. And Paul says, so it is now with us and God because we've been given access to it through Christ by our faith in Him. And this word access can often be translated into introduction, which gives us the implication of of being brought into someone's presence and favor by another. Martin Lloyd-Jones uses the example here of being invited into the presence of royalty. You wouldn't typically barge into a room and walk up to someone, someone royal and introduce yourself. And this invitation and introduction would need to come 
from another. And that's exactly what Jesus has done for us with the Father. And by His atoning death and His righteousness gifted to us, He's given us an introduction and access to the Father, one that is permanent and far more intimate than merely meeting a king or queen. And Pastor Garrison also preached a sermon a couple weeks ago on how Christ came to give us adoption as sons and daughters into God's family. This is a, an intimacy and a closeness with our God that cannot be overstated or over-celebrated. Christ has given us peace, yes, but not only that, He's also given us this even greater privileged position of grace as a beloved child of God. This also gives us a boldness and a confidence in our position before God. It's, it's why the author of Hebrews can say, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So then how does this inform and impact our daily lives as Christians? When we approach the Scriptures, are, are we doing so to hear our Father speak, telling us all that He's done for us, making known to us all of His promises? And what, what does this mean for our prayer lives? Are we going to our Father in prayer as a child, sharing with Him all of our affections and afflictions? And Tim Keller refers to this kind of access when he says, the only person who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. We have that kind of access. And church, God welcomes you into His presence at all times and in every situation. Because Jesus has brought us back into peace with God. He's given us permanent access to God in a position of grace as sons and daughters of the Heavenly Father. And we can live in light of and rejoice in these amazing privileges, but actually, there's even more to come. Paul goes on, the end of verse 2, to say, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So Paul adds this next phase of the sinner's benefits of being justified. We, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This word rejoice through Scripture is typically used for gladness and joy that leads to praise and exaltation of God. And certainly that is an appropriate response to, to what Paul is revealing to us here, but we are highly privileged Christian. And God deserves all that glory, honor, and praise as a response. However, I want us to see this, worse, this word for rejoice can also be translated as boasting in. As in, we can boast in hope of the glory of God. And the reason that we can boast with confidence in the hope of future glory is because it's an sure result that has been secured not by us, but by Christ. We can tend to boast in so many worldly things, our, our strength, our careers, our cars, or even our families. And though all these things are gifts for which we can thank God, they are not guaranteed and they're not lasting. We can, we can, however, rejoice or boast in our hope of future glory because it's secured for us. In a similar way, we need to take a closer look at this word used here for hope. And we can easily get tripped up by this word hope because we use it in such a different way in our daily conversations. And someone could ask me, do you think the Cowboys will win the Super Bowl this year? And I'll, I could say, I sure hope so. But that, that's just me wishing for an uncertain result, extremely uncertain. And just like Rudy's hope of football glory at Notre Dame was uncertain. But that's not how hope is used in the Bible, and it's not how Paul is using the word here. Hope is not a holy hoping for the best. Hope is another way of saying you have joyful and confident expectation of a future result. Paul's use of the word hope in this passage is, as the late theologian R.C. Sproul puts it, faith looking forward. It is trust in the God who has been faithful in keeping all of his promises and faith that he will continue to keep all of his promises into eternity. It's a certain source of joy and relief for the undeserving sinner. 
So based on Christ's finished work on the cross and by his righteousness given to us, we have the joyful and confident expectation of experiencing the future glory of God. So what is this glory? And Paul's referring here to the gift we've been given of eternal life. This is what we've spent all of Advent talking about and longing for when Christ comes back. It's what his bride, the church, has been wanting and longing for ever since he ascended into heaven to be with the Father. An eternity face to face with God and the new heavens and the new earth where we'll have a physical access to him that we don't yet get to enjoy, experiencing all of his majesty, all of his splendor, and all of his perfections in their fullness. An eternity where we will be resurrected with Christ and given glorified bodies like his in which we won't experience any kind of weakness or want, sin or suffering, decay or death. Total freedom, total happiness, and total glory. His future is sure because our Savior has secured it. And we rejoice in it. And so Jesus has won for us peace with God and restored relationship, an intimate access to God's grace as sons and daughters and the certain hope of a future glory in eternity. But how does this all help us now? How do these amazing benefits of being justified in Christ and having hope of future glory change how we live now? We're not to the future glory yet. And Christ has not come back yet to to call his people to himself once for all. So what does it mean for us as we live and the already and not yet of the kingdom, in a world still plagued by sin and suffering, where we experience pain and trials on a daily basis. Well, Paul goes on to address this dilemma in the next two verses. Look with me next at hope for the sufferer. Paul begins verse 3 by saying, not only that, but we can rejoice in our sufferings. And coming into this verse, we we first need to recognize this difficult truth that suffering is an inevitable part of life in a fallen world, even for the Christian. We've never been promised a life free from suffering. In fact, we've been promised the opposite, that suffering will likely even be worse for those who are following Christ. A servant is not greater than his master, so just as Jesus suffered and willingly endured the cross for the joy that was set before him, we also endure suffering in this life with the future hope of glory set before us. It's our early church father, Augustine. He makes this point when he says, God had one son on earth without sin, but never one without suffering. We follow our Savior down a narrow path to future glory. And And the path is not just covered with roses, but also with thorns. But still, I move into this section with much trepidation because I I know that so many of you, even in the short life of our church, has gone through times of immense suffering or are currently. Some of you experience deep suffering as a daily occurrence in your life. So I want you to know that Paul here is not trying to minimize or make light of your sufferings by saying, just rejoice. Paul himself knew immense suffering during his life of ministry for Christ. We get an idea of some of his sufferings in 2 Corinthians as he defends his ministry against the false apostles, saying, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, and hunger and thirst, 
often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's the daily pressures on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And hearing this list, it, it seems to me that Paul is certainly a worthy authority to speak to us about suffering. And I'm not putting this list of Paul's sufferings in front of us to cause us to start comparing our sufferings with his and therefore conclude maybe what we're going through isn't suffering. And we can deduce from Scripture that suffering is any trial or test that we go through that makes life harder. And this can include our, our mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual trials. So with that as our definition, I think that we can all say that we experience frequent sufferings in our lives. So what does Paul mean when he says we can rejoice in our sufferings? He's not saying here that we should be masochists who enjoy pain and suffering, nor is he saying that we should be stoics who ignore and endure without any emotion. It's right and even good for us to grieve and go to God to lament our suffering. But then how can Paul say that we can rejoice in our sufferings? Well, a big reason that we can rejoice or boast in our sufferings is because they're producing something in us in the present. Paul says in verse 3 and 4, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Church, we can rejoice in our sufferings because we know that they're not for nothing. Because of the redemption of our relationship with God, our relationship to everything has changed, and that includes suffering. They're not meaningless sufferings that we have to go through, but purposeful preparations being used by a sovereign God, and that keeps us from despair. But what good is suffering actually doing? And Paul lays out, a chain here of sorts in these verses that shows us what suffering is producing in the life of the Christian. The first link in the chain is that of endurance or perseverance. When we experience suffering, it's producing endurance in us in a similar way that our bodies produce antibodies when we have an infection. And the very thing that we need to help us in present and future sufferings is being produced amidst it. I know in our church we have quite a few runners and weightlifters. And when you, when you go out to start running to train for a race or when you first go into the gym to start lifting, it's hard. It brings a lot of pain. One of the most common expressions you hear when you start training for a race or when you're, you're training in the gym is no pain, no gain. And we're willing to experience that pain that is caused by this kind of training because we know that it's helping us to get stronger because it's preparing us for something, to run that marathon or to beat our deadlift record. But it can be a little harder for us to rejoice in suffering when we don't know exactly what it's doing. But James, the apostle and, and brother of Jesus, he tells us in his, in his epistle what it's producing. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's just like the pains of athletic training. Our trials are producing in us endurance or steadfastness. And this is exactly what we need to strengthen us as we run the race of life and carry the weight of suffering. And we can rejoice that God is providing this for us and, and making us ultimately perfect and complete like Christ and his endurance. But then Paul goes on with the next link in the chain. Endurance is producing in us character or strength of character. And this Greek word used here for character can also be translated as test or proof or quite literally the, the state or disposition of that which has been tried and approved. So what Paul is really telling us here about character is as we go through suffering, our faith is tested, and we come out on the other end 
with evidence and assurance of a tested faith that has proven true. Perseverance produces evidence. The Apostle Peter is making this point in his first epistle. As we heard in, in our liturgy this morning, he says, In this re- you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And there's a story from an unknown source on the internet, so you know it's true. But it does illustrate well what Paul and Peter are talking about here. The story goes that a group of women are studying the book of Malachi in the Old Testament together. And they, they come across chapter 3, verse 3, which says, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. To try and understand what this meant, one of the women decided that she would call up a silversmith, schedule an appointment with him to watch him work. And she didn't tell him why, other than that she was just curious about the process. It says the woman sat and watched the silversmith work. He explained to her that when refining silver, you have to hold the silver in the hottest part of the fire to burn away all the impurities. And that he has to sit there the entire time with his eyes on the silver to make sure that it's not damaged by leaving it in too long. The woman asked him, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? And the silversmith then smiled at her and said, oh, that's easy, when I see my image in it. You see, God sits as our refiner and purifier. We're destined to be conformed to the image of his son. And he's decided to use our sufferings to produce this character in us needed to make us more like Christ, to give us assurance that we're his. If we were all to think of a Christian right now that that we know and admire and whose faith we would like to imitate, we can be sure that this is a Christian who has likely endured much suffering in their life and whose faith has been tested over and over again and has proven true. But then Paul goes on with the final link in the chain. Character produces hope. So as we look at the entire chain, the endurance that is built through suffering enables us to come out on the other side of the testing of our faith, which then provides us with more hope of the future glory. And according to Paul, this this joyful and confident expectation of future glory is exactly what empowers us as we experience the sufferings of this life. This is what he encourages us with in, in 2 Corinthians when he says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look to the things that are seen, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And he continues with this point later in Romans in chapter 8 when he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And Paul has gotten a taste himself of the glory to come through his conversion encounter with Christ. And he ensures us here that the suffering that we go through in this life isn't even worth comparing alongside the glory that we'll experience when Jesus returns to usher in the fullness of the kingdom. And this isn't meant to minimize our sufferings, but to maximize our hope for what's to come and give us strength to press on toward the goal of the upward call in Christ. Paul's reorienting us here to an eternal perspective. I love the story that Pastor Tony Marita tells of a a baseball player whose team had just won the college World Series. After their win, he decided to keep some of the dirt from home plate of Rosenblatt Stadium where the, the college championship games were played. 
So he took some of the dirt, he put it in a bottle, and he, the next season he took that bottle of dirt with him to every single game. When things started to get difficult for the team, he would take out the bottle, and he would tell the players, guys, get a whiff of Rosenblatt Stadium. That's where we're going. A church, we would do well to encourage each other often with a reminder of where we're going. And we'll have suffering in this life, yes, but we have much glory ahead and an ultimate hope to look forward to. Yet Paul shows us still another way that God has given us assurance of this hope in the next verse. Look with me lastly at hope for the saint. Paul continues in verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. As saints of the Lord, we can be certain that at the final judgment, our hope will not put us to shame or disappoint us because God has given us his Holy Spirit. He's poured his love into our hearts through him. God gives us his spirit at our conversion as a gift of his love but also as a seal and a guarantee of our future. Paul tells us this in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, He who has prepared us for this very thing, that is, eternal life, is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Church, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of the Lord. This should give us great hope and assurance that we will not be put to shame in the coming judgment, but we will be welcomed into his glory and in his presence forever. However, this is not the only ministry that the, that the Spirit performs for us, according to Paul here. Though being given the Holy Spirit is, is a one-time event that happens at our conversion, our experiencing God's love through him is continuous and unceasing. When we encounter God in his word, when we go to him in prayer, when we come together as his people every Lord's Day to worship him, we experience this continuous outpouring of his love. We also experience it through the sacraments, the Lord's Supper and baptism. And when we come up to the table each week and we take the bread and the cup, the Spirit reminds us of God's great love for us in Christ's death on the cross. but he also reminds us of it through baptism. And Christian, when was the last time that you remembered your baptism? We just celebrated a couple of baptisms here recently. It was, it was an incredibly joyous time, not just for the two that were baptized and their families, but for every Christian that was here. We don't sit passively as spectators while someone is baptized. We participate in it as a family. We are celebrating together that this sacrament that's been given to the church to celebrate and that God has brought more into his fold. But we're also celebrating as we remember our own baptism. This reminds us that God has saved us and has given us his Holy Spirit. We get to experience his boundless love all over again. See, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us is one of continuously filling us with the great love that God has for us. That's why Paul says that God's love has been poured out for us. God lavishes us with his love. He's not stingy with it. This isn't a one-time pouring out. It's a lifelong gift to those who've been justified in Christ. It should fill us with hope and rejoicing. So Paul, he set out in this passage to, to give us a true hope as sinners suffers, and saints. And he does that by showing us the hope we have in our future glory because of the new position we've been given with God. He also shows us that even in our sufferings, we can have hope because God is using them to refine and purify us. But then he also gives us hope as saints by showing us the assurance we can have a future glory because we've been given the Holy Spirit through whom God cause us to experience his everlasting love. But we have a foundation still more solid that makes these truths come to life for us. 
We have to recall Paul's words in verse 1, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our salvation and all of its benefits that come through Him and His finished work on the cross for us. He's the reason we can rejoice. And it's Him the Holy Spirit bears witness about. Just as in Colossians 1, Paul refers to the hope of glory as Christ in you. So it's in Him alone that we have peace, grace, and glory. And it's in Him alone that our hope is found. So as Charles Spurgeon rightly reminds us, do not look to your hope, but to Christ, the source of your hope. So church, as we, as we go into a new year, let this passage be a reminder to us that that we can be people of rejoicing because we are people with hope. Let's rejoice in these blessings God has given us in our justification. Let's rejoice in our hope of future glory. Let's rejoice even in our sufferings knowing that they're producing in us more hope. Let's rejoice in the assurance God has given us by His love through His Spirit. But most of all, let's rejoice always in Jesus Christ our loving Savior, and the very source of our hope. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are a gracious and merciful God. You've paid the costly price of sending your only Son to die for undeserving sinners so that our relationship with you could be restored. Thank you for the wonderful blessings you've given us in Christ and for the hope you've given us as sinners, sufferers, and saints. We ask that you'd help us to rejoice in the sure hope you've given us for future glory, that you continue to give us perseverance as we go through trials that test our faith. Help us to always fix our eyes on Jesus, the source of our hope and strength so that we can be filled with hope and assurance all the more as we see the day drawing near. We love you, Father. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.